so ma'am we are starting ma'am yeah so very good evening doctors i am dr stalin on behalf of uh, shield healthcare welcoming you all for today's webinar so the topic for today's webinar is uh, management of stress urinary incontinence i welcome all the participants and i request them to post their queries in the chat box uh, so that we can have a short uh, qa session at the end of this presentation and now it's time to introduce our invited speaker for the day uh, dr meera raghavan man uh, madam is currently the senior consultant uro gynecologist and robotic surgeon at apollo hospitals chennai uh, madam was also the consultant in uh, obstetrics and gynecology at a leading university teaching hospital in south manchester uk for 5 years and uh, madam was also a uh, mrcog trainer examiner and core faculty at gibbs and uh, uro uro gynae sub committee of foxy faculty at ethicon and organizing chairperson for uh, febicon 2019 chennai madam has received various honors like fellow of royal college of obstetrics and gynae from uk and executive committee members at uh, gibbs and uh, atn rcog and aicc rcog 2020 madam has received various awards like uh, best uh, resident in obstetrics and gynae in 1999 from um, pgi mer and uh, winner of prestigious John Stone Gold Medal in Madras Medical College for Best Outgoing Students and Madam has uh, is a various uh, publications in national and international journals. So with this short introduction, I welcome you, ma'am, and I'm handing the section to you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Just going to uh, start off with the uh, series of Eurogyne uh, sessions, and the first one I thought it would be good if we can. Um, start with stress urinary incontinence as that is quite common among most of our women um ma'am you need to share your screen ma'am yeah yeah i will do that So we're going to deal with the cycle of menstruation. What is urinary incontinence basically? Stress urinary incontinence itself. What are the important risk factors? How to be diagnosed? How we actually make a difference between SUI and active bladder? Needs urodynamics. When to do urodynamics? Summary of all the interventions which can possibly do for this. So we all know menstruation is an active process and can occur normally only if there is a sequential happening and in the correct way everything is going to be following each other. For example, when the bladder is filled up, as at the same time the urethral sphincter is remaining closed, as the bladder fills up, there is a center activated relaxation. of the bladder which allows the filling if this was not to happen then what happens is the patient even in a automatically will get a reflex emptying of the bladder which can be found in spinal injuries or in problems where the suprapontine areas are also affected we will not go much into the details of the physiology Because that is not in the scope of this particular uh, session, and then the cortex perceives that this person needs to boil, begins to seek a toilet, and when the space, the time, and the uh, uh, place is appropriate, then the cortical center facilitates the urination act by relaxing the urethral sphincter. The pelvic floor muscle doesn't contract here; it relaxes. The detrusor muscle contracts, thereby facilitating emptying the bladder. If there was a disturbance in the nerve pathways or the mobility is impaired, or there is a disturbance in the detrusor activity, or the pelvic floor is very tight, any of these can cause derangement in the menstruation cycle and cause some incontinence avoiding dysfunction of some nature. So urinary incontinence is a complaint, as we all know, where there is an involuntary loss of urine. So the major impact on quality of life 
is because these patients feel that if they cough, laugh, or sneeze, which is unpredictable, then this accident happens. So they are very scared, fear of the urinal odor. They are worried about the cost coming with it with regards to the sanitation products, limitation of the color of the clothing they wear, limitation of the independence of uh, movement they can have. Especially, I have seen patients who say, if I run, I get this, so I've stopped running or stopped exercising. They constantly map in wherever the places they visit, they toilet map, basically look out for toilets. And they seclude themselves socially and become housebound. However, because of the inhibitory nature of our cultural practices, women don't come forward voluntarily with these complaints and feel embarrassed to talk about it all the time. And it is somewhat reconciliation to the fact that they consider it to be normal after childbirth or as part of aging. I've seen many women say, oh, my grandma had it or my mother had it. I will have incontinence after vaginal delivery or this is the reason I was thinking I should have cesarean section. So actually, uh, the mode of delivery does not determine whether somebody will have stress urinary incontinence or not. However, if there was to be uh, multiple vaginal deliveries or traumatic vaginal deliveries, there's a high likelihood they can have uh, stress urinary incontinence. Now, the type of the incontinence is also important to be determined and mostly by clinical assessment and history taking where there can be an accompaniment of urinary urgency and frequency usually denotes an overactive bladder. Stress urinary incontinence means loss of urine with um, unprecedented cough, exertion, sneezing, or laughing. Fixed incontinence is combination of both, and then you have overflow incontinence where basically the bladder overflows due to an obstruction or because of retention. And total incontinence, I suppose, uh, fistula where they can make complaints of continuous leakage. So coming to the most important aspect of stress urinary incontinence, we all know it is because of an increase of dominant pressure and that bothersome effects on the patient's quality of life. So the physical activity which can precipitate such an act, uh, incontinence would be anything which increases the intra-abdominal pressure. Patients when they refer to this such an accident, they say flooding, leaking, or gushing, and dripping. Patient may initially present with pretty complaints of frequency, urgency, and dysuria, because it could be menopausal, or they have learned the habit of going and emptying the bladder and keeping it empty all the time. <coughs> so a sudden cough during a full bladder does not precipitate such an accident. How prevalent is this problem. Nearly about 15% of women can have this. Of that, nearly three quarters of them can have severely bothersome symptoms. And majority, more than a fourth, can have really worrying kind of symptoms. Uh, to that extent, they are housebound. And it is the degree of bother is directly proportional to the severity of SUI. So an occasional leakage, the patient only attempts to tell you on repeated probing is probably not causing her a great degree of bother and is not going to denote a severe degree of SUI. So what are the risk factors and who are the groups of women particularly at risk for this problem? Pregnant women are particularly at risk of SUI but can be reversed as soon as the delivery is over. Postpartum women because of the pelvic fluid laxity so pelvic floor exercises can reverse. Menopause of women, older people and people with disability or disability have. What are the risk factors which aggravate it? Aging, any multiple vaginal deliveries or traumatic deliveries, early menopause or menopause with severe estrogen deficiency, presence of constipation, surgical procedures, especially pelvic surgery, like extensive uh, pelvic surgery, like what we radical surgeries, consumption of alcohol, high caffeine intake, smoking, obesity, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders can aggravate the SUI. These are the reasons for postpartum SUI. It is all quite predictable and understandable why these conditions will increase the risk of SUI.
So what is the basic underlying difference in the way these uh, incontinence manifest? In as far as the stress urinary incontinence, the problem lies in pelvic floor and the outlet. So the urethra has a certain amount of integral resistance which it offers, as well as the pelvic floor adds on to the strengthening of the outlet system. So if you can imagine the urethra as a pipe outlet, the sphincter basically acts like the washer mechanism and the uh, pelvic floor acts like the outer ring which we have in the pipe. Suppose the pipe was to leak constantly, that could be because of the outer rings which are found in the pipe not having a proper screwing mechanism which is what the pelvic floor does and if there is a washer mechanism which is lacking that could also lead to leakage. This is what happens with regards to the SUI. What about urinary urge incontinence? It is usually due to uninhibited or unprovoked involuntary contractions of the bladder muscle, causing excessive bladder pressure to build up, which automatically exceeds the urethral pressure, sufficient enough to cause a sudden contraction and gush of urine. That is called bladder or detrusor overactivity, which is actually a urodynamic fighting. Whereas overactive bladder is a clinical diagnosis. So whenever we do urodynamics for these patients, we are attempting to find whether the patient has a stable or an unstable bladder, whether their urethra is competent or incompetent, whether the bladder is compliant or less or non-compliant. These are the findings we're trying to say. So for an SUI, what we will be writing is urodynamic evidence of urethral incompetence in the presence of a stable bladder. If I was to write urethral incompetence in the presence of an unstable bladder showing features of detrus or overactivity, I am calling this as mixed incontinence rather than pure stress incontinence. So that is the difference in how we report the urodynamic findings. So is there a co correlation between the severity of the symptoms and urodynamic or the nature of the symptoms and the urodynamic diagnosis? This is a study who, of nearly 1,000 odd patients in a urodynamic clinic and you can see that with regards to the urodynamic clinic and the correlation, 11% had pure SUI symptoms, 15% had pure urge incontinence symptoms, and 74% had mixed urinary incontinence symptoms. Now, when you looked at them, there you look at their uh, urodynamic assessment, Majority of the patients with SUI had urodynamic incontinence, stress incontinence, or urodynamic stress incontinence with detrus or overactivity, or even bladder dysfunction, voiding dysfunction, as well as bladder hypersensitivity, where the bladder capacity was less than 300 ml and still they wanted to urinate. So the reason why I put up the slide is many people are of the view that SUI do not need, if it was a straightforward SUI, they do not need any dynamic test. You go in straight and put in a surgical tape. The answer would be very cautiously approached because this study clearly shows that when you do urodynamic assessments, majority of the patients were not clear cut, genuine stress urinary incontinence. They had other features of detrus or overactivity, voiding dysfunction, or a sensitive bladder. So, it, with, if we don't take steps to correct these other problems, the patient can still continue to have the cage, still consider to have herself a failed surgery. That can be difficult when you counsel patients postoperatively or seek out reasons why there are features of incontinence still persisting.
So the types of uh, stress urinary incontinence, I'm not going to go much into the details. Anything which is remaining normal, that is not such a severe urinary incontinence as well as the stress leak is concerned. So type 2B, where there's a significant hypermobility, and a type 3, where it will be difficult to manage. And uh, in fact, type 2B, when there is a descent, will be definitely better managed by a uh, tape, whereas intrinsic sphincter deficiency might be just hard to counsel and correct by just a tape and might need a bit more than that. So what is the role of the cough test when you establish latent stress urinary incontinence? Now, we all know pelvic organ prolapse patients. We routinely ask them whether they have any incontinence issues. So SUI that occurs following POP therapy or treatment or surgery in otherwise patients who are continent prior to the surgery is called occult or latent stress urinary incontinence. We are basically masking or unmasking the incontinence which would have otherwise been present should there be a position of the bladder or the uterus in the correct anatomical position. So they have a bladder which is descended down, the urethra is higher up, the prolapse patient is not going to complain of any stress urinary incontinence. Say I corrected the bladder position, now it is in line with the urethra. So after surgery, the woman coughs, sneezes or laughs, she will have leakage. So I have basically unmasked a potential stress urinary incontinence by correcting prolapse which also means I have probably failed to look for this occult SUI at the time of preoperative assessment of the patient. So how to do this will be the question. So reduction cough stress testing can help identify those patients with a positive predictive value of nearly 60%. So you do 100 cases by a reduced prolapse, Preoperatively, by some method or other, I would be able to predict nearly that if it was positive, 60% will be likely to develop SUI in the future with the corrective surgery. So I need to do something about it. So latent SUI is a potential complication with advanced POP, the necessity for proper thorough preoperative counseling and diagnosis. And we can either do a staged procedure or a combined procedure, but it is very pertinent and important to involve the patient in that decision making. And that communication has to be clearly documented. Management of SUI. Now, this is the most important aspect where we have multitude of interventions, both non-surgical and surgical. Non-surgical include lifestyle interventions, which cannot be taken lightly in the current scenario of the FDA uh, ban on many of the artificial tapes. Pelvic floor exercises, nerve stimulation, occlusive and elevated devices, laser therapy and pharmacological treatment. Surgical treatment will be called for suspension, mid-urethral slings, both the retropubic and the transoperator and the PBS and the urethral bulking agents. So women with SUI, we have to clearly take a proper history, careful medical history, assess the degree of bother and its effect on the lifestyle, the quality of life with help of bladder diaries and the severity of the situation. Offer them or clearly recommend lifestyle modification with the proper pelvic floor rehabilitation and muscle strengthening therapy for at least three months. In moderate to severe, will be first step would be local therapy. And when failure happens, depending upon the patient condition, you can go ahead either with a surgical therapy or a bulking agent. When should the specialist come into position? Definitely, if you're dealing with a mixed incontinence of the surety of the diagnosis is not there. When the urodynamic testing does not make you any wiser, 
when your conservative therapy fails, when there is a neurological condition, it's a recurrent SUI, when there is hematuria, or it's a recurrent UTI. So the way most important lifestyle interventions of weight reduction, even a 5% weight loss, will affect nearly 50% improvement in the stress incontinence. More postural changes, such as crossing the legs and kind of going tippy toes, will help. And this is called the knack maneuver for reducing the leakage which can happen with a cough. And basically what it is, is when the patient knows there's going to be another cough or sneeze, they do this and contract the pelvic floor voluntarily. It actually aborts the leakage in nearly 60% of the patients in more than 70% of the time. So this is called the knack maneuver, which should be taught to every woman so they don't embarrass themselves in public. Decreasing the fluid intake to an optimum of 1.5 to 2 liters, especially in obsessive fluid intake people, is quite encourageable in this situation. And voiding prior to strenuous activity, good for marathon runners, good for patients who do deadlift and things like that, or training sessions or kickboxes, so on and so forth, and especially dancers, because many of them come and tell me prior to this, they were not having this problem. Dancing makes them leak. So empty your bladder prior to dancing. What is pelvic floor muscle training? Designed to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles and the first line treatment for stress and incontinence. In fact, it is a prophylactic treatment to prevent any pelvic floor disorders and all our women out there should be doing it every day, twice a day, lifelong, from the point of the first delivery. So as to prevent any future occurrence of prolapse or incontinence, and this has been scientifically evidence proven. It should be offered as first line conservative management to women, should be offered particularly in SUI. And to maximize the chance, women must do the exercise correctly, regularly. Many physical therapists do recommend training for at least three to four times per week three repetitions of eight to 10 sustained contractions each time. So the best time to find whether the pelvic floor has got good grade or tone is by using uh, your two fingers in the vagina, knowing the PERFECT method. PERFECT is the acronym for P standing for power, E for uh, the endurance of the contraction, R for the repetitiveness of the contraction, um, and uh, every contraction being timed as well as the force of the contraction. So it is very, very important to know this while you're doing the clinical examination. The only drug which is suitable for treatment at that to temporarily is um, the loxetine because mild ones will definitely benefit with lifestyle modulation as well as weight loss and physiotherapy. It is only reserved temporarily for moderate to severe and it's usually 40 milligrams twice daily. And they found there was a 59% experiencing decrease in the uh, leakage, and that was associated with significant improvement in the quality of life scores with duloxetine as compared to the placebo. So the study basically told it is quite safe and efficacious as the pharmacological treatment given on the dosage of 40 milligrams twice a day for a period of 8 to 12 weeks. And it was significantly improving quality of life scores. What is the surgical treatment armamentarium got to offer us? Gold, uh, the gold standard for the treatment of SUIs so far was the Birch Convo suspension. We all know it involves placement of the sutures around the bladder neck, lifting up the paracolpia and to support the bladder base. But with that, the main problem is if you hitch it up too tight, it can cause hypercontinence and the patient can go into retention and might need intermittent catheterization or an indwelling catheter. A laparoscopic colpo suspension is relatively newer procedure with the advantage over it for the minimal access nature of the surgery. And there is significantly higher urodynamic cure rate, but as far as the patient is concerned, you can have a higher 
hypercontinence rate and deeper catheterization. Laparoscopic colpus suspension was demonstrated to have nearly a 10% higher risk of failure. The sutures we use are permanent sutures like proline, which then anchor to both sides of the iliopectineal ligament or the Cooper's ligament. Considering the minimally invasive nature, the mid urethral slings came into vogue and pretty much replaced the Birch Colpo suspension. They can be made of the autologous material, which are naturally occurring tissues such as the fascia lata or the rectus abdominis fascia. And we use otherwise polypropylene monofilament macroporous meshes or slings. I would prefer to call them tapes or slings. Meshes is not the correct terminology because vaginal meshes are completely banned. The advantages of this epidurethral slings, it can be a day surgery, requires hardly half an hour and the time to return to work is nearly two weeks and no restrictions after four weeks. However, they can have risk of bleeding, infection, or can be too tight cotton retention and one in 10 can have later on some sling related problems. The type of the slings which are used because of the polypropylene tape can either be a retropubic approach where there is an anchoring. I, when, I when I can counsel my patients, I tell them it's basically like putting up a shoe sling which tightens the shoe. That is the exact way the tension free vaginal tape acts, whereas the transobturator tape acts like a hammock under and runs towards the obturator foramen, thereby supporting the bladder neck. There is a basic minimum which we have to follow before we do any intervention surgically for the treatment of SUI. A thorough history, a proper clinical examination, a urine analysis to rule out blood and urine and urinary tract infection, assess whether urethra is mobile. The urethra is not mobile, it can be a rigid urethra, and sometimes the transoperative tape will not work. And it could also be intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Clinically demonstrate the stress urinary incontinence. Always make sure there's no voiding dysfunction or retention of urine by doing a post voidal residual urine volume. If it's going to be more than 100, likelihood that the sling procedures can lead the woman for the need of catheterization or clean intermittent catheterization. We proceed doing uh, without these particular assessments, we could end up in a lot more complications associated with the surgery. Urodynamics and stress incontinence, I personally think most of our patients are not pure SUI because they have complicated SUI. That's period. And therefore, I prefer to do urodynamic evaluation in all patients of SUI if I am planning surgery. So this is what um, uh, the study said that in a retrospective study, nearly about 3,000 odd women were found to have SUI. If we were to operate on all of them without doing the urodynamics, there were only 8% were classified as having pure SUI. Nearly about 78% um, had urodynamic stress incontinence. Of them, a varying proportions of patients had either mixed incontinence or detrus or overactivity or some degree of voiding dysfunction as evidenced by the PBR. So, urodynamic investigations provide useful information and assessment of women with the history of pure SUI because as many as 20% of them might not need surgery as first-line treatment. So the indications for urodynamic testing are complicated use of SUI, recurrent SUI, patients who are older and more than 60 years, continuous or unpredictable leakage, and history of any radical pelvic surgery or pelvic irradiation. So how good is the cough test in predicting the presence of a diagnostic ability to achieve whether SUI is present? 
it is very, very good in detecting whether the uh, patient will have SUI. Nearly cough test was positive in 92% of the patients where they reported symptoms of SUI, as opposed to only 30% where they did not have any symptoms. And it is always lower in patients who had an empty bladder than opposed to a patient who had a fuller bladder. So it is very, very important how we do the cough stress test. Cough stress test will produce the correct result if you do multiple different patient positions. First standing, semi-lithotomy, with the pessary reducing the flaps, and with the bladder volume at least more than 200 ml. This is about the choice of various procedures and the reason why we would choose to do the different procedures. Say, for example, the mixed urinary incontinence. The TOT, TOT improves or does not exacerbate the mixed urinary incontinence. The extant TBT might, so TOT was preferred. In cases where there could be a rigid urethra or no hypermobility or intrinsic structure deficiency, the TBT would be preferably better because this will give better urethral resistance and thereby prevent incontinence recurrence. With prolapse, either is fine, but make sure the bladder function is good. Occult SUI, both are fine simultaneously or as a staged procedure after correction of the prolapse. Never do incontinence procedure before doing the sister seal correction because the angle changes, then your tape placement also will become wrong. So always correct the prolapse. First, do the sister seal repair. Then with a separate incision, insert the TBT or the TOT. In recurrent SCY with a history of sling complication, probably the patient should not have a repeat artificial tape, should go in for autologous facial sling or even periurethral injections. So when do I know this patient might not be that successful? And what are the clinical risk factors? And how can I predict by way of urodynamics? Very, very crucial to tell the patient as part of the counseling and the consenting process. When the patient has mixed urinary incontinence, they have a very high BMI, previous failed surgery, high uncontrolled sugars, or age more than 75, generally tend not to do very well with regards to the continence. Urodynamically, if you find severe detrus or overactivity, bladder dysfunction, rigid urethra, and lower urethral pressures, which is suggestive of intrinsic sphincter deficiency, these patients also have poorer outcome after SUI surgery. This is was to compare the TBT and the TOT success rate, clearly shows that retropubic TBT is more effective surgical option as opposed to TOT in women with SUI after the vaginal mesh repair. So what could be the indication for doing a, a, a pubovaginal sling? This is because of a mid-urethral complex deficiency or in the presence of concomitancy, cystocene, or neurological conditions associated with severe uh, urethral incompetence as well. When there is a need for urethral reconstruction because you do not want to put in synthetic tape that can cause uh, fistulas, that can cause mesh perforation and diverticulate, or in the presence of a failed pulpo suspension or a medieval slip. This is very, very important to know because with the current ban scenario for the FDA on the tapes and meshes, this is probably one of the comeback surgery, which gives us good results as opposed to any artificial tapes with the associated uh, sling complications. Um, this very, very uh, good way to support the urethra and the two to three centimeter width of the sling, sufficient urethral support. It's durable, less uh, tissue reaction and remains intact. It is the autologous standard, gold standard, applying a pubovaginal sling. We also have uh, the advantages of um, mainly having natural scaffold for the remodeling of the collagen tissue, no urethral erosion, 
and least degradation in the long term. However, it can prolong the operative time, can cause an incisional hernia and a celoma, especially in obese patients. A retro, a rectus facial sling can be used in case of previous abdominal surgeries. However, contraindicated when there has been a prior ventral hernia repair. The fascia lattice a sling. The advantages are lesser recovery time, no risk of ventral hernia. However, the patient can have some walking difficulty for about one week post-op. There can be a thigh muscle herniation, the need for two separate incisions and positioning, unfamiliar anatomy as far as the thigh is concerned, and increased operating time. The most important aspect in any surgical procedures as far as stress urinary incontinence, you have to consider the fact that stress urinary incontinence is not a life-threatening condition. It is a quality of life issue. So whatever procedure we are doing is to improve the quality of life rather than cause any discomfort or harm to the patient. At the same time, the patient cannot be without some intervention. So we have to clearly explain the permanent nature of the surgery, the risk of the complications involved, the pros and cons of both the autologous slings and the synthetic slings, possible voiding difficulty, and the appearance of de novo urgency and frequency, and in some patients with TBT, pulpo suspension, and the uh, pubovaginal sling, it's important that we counsel them for the need for clean intermittent self catheterization. If we do that and the patient goes into retention, we will be in a difficult position to explain to the patient that's one of the expected adverse effects which can happen with continent surgery. The preparation is quite simple. We do IV antibiotics, intermittent pneumocompression, bladder catheterization and moderate trend work and a vaginal ring retractor. This is just to uh, craft harvest as to how we do the pubovaginal sling harvest and the fascia lata sling harvest. With this, the uh, uh, dissection in the vagina is the same as we do for TBT and the positioning of the uh, pubovaginal sling is the same. I tend to apply two proline sutures at the end of the pubovaginal rectus sheet sling and tie it without tension on the top so that there is no hypercontinence or retention which is created. The success rate averages nearly 80% cure rate, even with complica complicated cases such as radiation associated SUI, spinal cord trauma, and pelvic trauma, where the urethra is completely sclayed and we have to reconstruct it. Um, the sister trial was a stress incontinence surgical treatment efficiency trial, which compared the uh, sling with the autologous sling with the birch cord suspension, showed that pubovaginal sling had better Q rates as opposed to the birch cord suspension, however, associated with higher rates of voiding dysfunction. And there can be a development of urge incontinence nearly 2 to 20%. Urethral bulking agents are the preferred medications for patients who cannot have the surgery or we are doing something temporary, which will work for at least five years, but may have to be uh, not so good in offering a permanent solution. It is an alternative to sling uh, surgery itself, recommended for elderly and who are reluctant to undergo sling surgery. It's basically injected into the subucus and play, raising collagen cushions underneath the urethral submucosa, which thickens and causes coaptation of the urethral mucosa. Basically, it restores the washer mechanism, which I was describing earlier, and thereby making the patient continent. It can be used in women who've already undergone surgery without any benefit. The ideal agent, which is injectable, should be biocompatible, durable, hypoallergenic, and should heal better with minimal scarring. So in general, there can be multiple complications of surgical management, mainly voiding difficulty, urinary tract infection, 
post-operative sexual dysfunction, possible erosion of mesh or exposure of mesh, sometimes the recurrent urinary incontinence or pelvic organ prolapse, injury at the time of surgery to the bladder or to the urethra, and sometimes when the patient is not properly positioned, has had multiple abdominal surgeries or head down position is not given in the bowels or not moved off, an injury to the bowel also can be documented. So, in summary, for morbidly and moderately obese women, weight loss definitely helps reduce the severity of urinary symptoms. Medical therapy and rehab should be the first step of treatment. mid urethral slings are gold standard for surgical intervention as far as stress urinary incontinence is concerned. TBT, TBT hole, and high long-term success rates. Urethral bulking agents reserved for patients in elderly age group and in patients with higher anesthetic risk or who are refusing to undergo any invasive procedure. The best therapeutic approach for recurrent urinary incontinence after a sling failure should be individualized, preferably a, 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 a PVS, a pubovaginal autologous sling, or possibly a TBT. Best choice could be to counsel repeat MUS for a retropubic or a transoperator or bulking agents to women with recurrent stress urinary incontinence. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful and detailed presentation, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, let me wait for one or two minutes for the participants to post their queries, ma'am. So if there is any queries, then I will read it for you, ma'am. Sure. Uh, ma'am, uh, I have one query like, uh, what will be the role of this uh, laser treatment in this uh, urinary incontinence? And, uh, I know there are many people who are talking about laser. Now, there are uh, lasers which are done for a vaginal rejuvenation, which is a separate indication, and sometimes for mild SUI. We have to understand that mild SUI, which can be collected just by weight loss and physiotherapy, why subjected them to an intervention which is not scientifically evidenced to give complete relief, which needs three settings, and which might have to be repeated as well. So, I do not recommend laser as treatment for the first line therapy, even if it is mild. The first line therapy will still be lifestyle modifications and pelvic floor physiotherapy and rehab under supervision on a weekly basis. So that is very, very important message I would like to share with you. Yes, ma'am. In case of menopausal women, ma'am, when they are going for this uh, urinary incontinence, in those cases, whether lesser treatment can be given or the treatment should be same for... Uh... The reason for menopausal women undergoing gen uh, the laser treatment is a completely different diagnosis. They get it for genitourinary syndrome of menopause, which leads to the atrophic vaginitis and thereby causes severe burning as well as atrophy in that area and can cause problems. And that is done for different symptomatology and reasons. Pertaining only to SUI, it might not be that effective and is not strongly recommended by the evidence base out there. Though it is now showing some promising results, we still have to wait for guidelines as to whether it's effective. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have one question. Uh, uh, what is the role of this Marshall test in evaluation of this urinary continence, ma'am? It, it's basically, if you do your cough test properly and you are convinced there is definitely a leakage and there is hypermobility of the urethra, you can see the urethra descending, that categorically tells you there is stress urinary incontinence. That when you occlude the urethra and you stop the incontinence, that is that clearly tells you some intervention which will elevate the urethra will stop the incontinence. So we have to make sure that we involve procedures with regards to elevating the urethra if there is a hypermobility. All the cough tests are basically to find out 
if there is a leakage at the time of cough, if there is a descent, if those two points can be clearly made out at the time of examination of the patient test. Okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, we have another one question. Like, uh, is there any medications that uh, cause or exacerbate this uh, urinary incontinence, ma'am? They do say that uh, patients who are on alpha blockers, we don't see many women on alpha blockers, which um, have uh, Urimax kind of uh, preparations, Tamsulosin, can aggravate some degree of their stress urinary incontinence. But we don't have so many patients on the alpha blockers. So that is potentially a theoretical postulate which says these patients can Yes, fine, ma'am. What we see in the post-COVID era, thanks to all the uh, medications they receive, their proximal muscle weakness, their steroid therapy, their sugars becoming uncontrolled, the need for oxygen and the respiratory work they have to do. This has aggravated already pre-existing incontinence, especially stress urinary incontinence and mixed incontinence. Yeah, ma'am. That was the next question, ma'am. You have already answered this question. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is something I see uh, in a clinic. At least 50% are post-COVID recovered patients nowadays. They either come with a recurrent urinary tract infection, sepsis, or uh, aggravation of the pre-existing stress incontinence due to their steroids, due to their respiratory insufficiency or even sometimes overactive bladder symptoms and mixed incontinence. I haven't seen any ret retention I've seen in acute COVID patients when they have had a sepsis or they have had a neurological event as a result of the uh, COVID, but not in the recovered patient. The recovered patients, what I see is they have severe proximal muscle weakness. So they're not immediately able to get up from the chair. So they put on pressure and get up, they leak. That over time tends to get better. So at this point of time, we should not jump into advice surgery and things like that. Maybe we should teach them pelvic floor exercises as part of their physiotherapy schedule and correct it slowly. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, I don't find any other questions in the chat box, ma'am. So okay. if, you, if you allow us, then we can end the webinar, ma'am. So if there is any questions, I will be forwarding you to your my lady, ma'am. You can address on that. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, being with us today, ma'am. You have spent your, very, your valuable time with us. And I also like to thank the participants for their active participation, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, one and all, ma'am. On behalf thank of you, so here, I thank you, everyone. Thank you. Sure, ma'am. Uh, by next week, I'll meet you, ma'am. I'll meet you personally. Yeah, sure. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much.